Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we will wrap the week. We'll focus on how the market conditions have changed in the last five days. Forget about the last five days, about the last 24 hours with distribution mode yesterday with Wednesday into Thursday showing weakness pretty much across the board. But today, quite the rebound in the, in the cyclical sectors, financials, energy, materials, industrials, all ripping higher growth as well. The defensive is the only one that are lagging. Let's look at all the charts together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at the markets together through the lens of technical analysis, leveraging the power of stock charts to review all the market conditions, focus on messages of price, breadth, and sentiment. And on a day like today with the S&P pushing to new all-time highs, pushing to new all-time closing highs, just around 43.70, we have this mix of signals, I would argue. In terms of checks in the plus column, you have price that is continuing to go higher. And I was told by a mentor, the most bullish thing the market can do is go up. And that's what we're certainly seeing. On the downside, you have breadth conditions that are arguably very, very mixed. If you look at the conditions right now, looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines, we're going to look at them a little later in our wrap the week segment. You'll see that it looks very similar to February of 2020. So we're going to look at all those charts together, see what we think about the relationship between the strength in price, the weakness in breadth, and all the other chart patterns we can review. Now, we have some great guests on this show. This week was a lot of fun. We had Mark Newton uh, from Newton Advisors joining us yesterday. Next week, we have our charting the second half special running all next week. My show on Monday, we'll uh, feature a, a second half of the year outlook. And then every day, we're going to feature great expertise from people like Martin Fring, Linda Rashke, Tony Dwyer, Gina Martin-Adams, many, many more, a panel during the week as well, all trying to give you new ways to think about the second half of this year. On this show, our guests are, uh, are fantastic next week. Tuesday, the 13th, Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily. On Wednesday, the 14th, Willie Delwich from uh, All Star Charts. And then on Thursday, the 15th, Christopher Mullen from the technical traders. So it should be a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, join us all next week on Stock Charts TV and The Final Bar. Let's continue on to our Wrap the Week segment. We'd like to start with a poll. We love to ask you uh, poll questions at all times on our live stream page. We also like to send them out via social media. Anytime you see them, uh, you know, respond and I'll uh, see what some of your uh, fellow viewers are saying and thinking. Recently, we asked you about technical indicators, particularly candle patterns. And the question was, in a downtrend, you have a long down candle followed by a long up candle. Day two closes about 75% of the way back up through the first candle's real body. That's kind of a key uh, uh, point there. And which pattern is this? Doji incorrect. That's actually where the open and close are right about the same. Bearish engulfing pattern really only happens in an uptrend, so that's impossible. A bullish engulfing pattern close, but not quite. So bullish engulfing pattern would be if day two was closed above the open of day one. So the correct answer, which 59% of you said, was the bullish piercing line pattern. The bullish piercing line, the bullish engulfing patterns both pop, uh, pop up during downtrends. They both are bullish reversal candles if you would see them pop up on your chart. If you're unfamiliar with some of those candle patterns, go to our chart school, free set of resources, where we include a lot of chart patterns to give you examples and ideas of how to navigate those. Continuing on with our uh, Wrap the Week segment, you know, looking at this week, I, you know, I often talk about how Friday is a chance to look at how the markets have evolved in the last seven days, the last five trading days, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the shortened week after the 4th of July holiday. Uh, and overall, to be honest with you, it was sort of a, uh, a mixed week. There were certain points in the week where, where it felt like distribution was accelerating. And I think Thursday sort of felt like that, Wednesday into Thursday. All of a sudden, you saw a bit of a, a rollover, and even though they uh, you know, recovered a little bit, it had been a gap lower, and it felt like there was some, uh, some severe weakness. Today, completely turning, you see right rates going back higher, and it's worth noting that rates are moving in line with uh, the markets here. Uh, and so it's sort of the, 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 the level of the tenure is indicating uh, strength in the economy, according to what the market is saying. My friend Matt Maley at Miller uh, Tabak pointed that out to me uh, this morning. So overall, higher rates today uh, indicating 
Uh, we are not at peak growth, apparently, for one day only, and you're seeing stocks uh, continue to uh, push higher. Let's do very quickly a, a market recap here, seeing what happened uh, just today. We'll look at our wrap the week chart and look at the last four trading days and see what's happened, and then we'll finish off looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. So the stock market in the form of the S&P 500, finishing up about 1.1%, closing just below 4370. Uh, That's a new all-time high and new all-time closing high for the S&P. So if you're looking for evidence in the form of price, you certainly got it. For the first time, and I feel like forever, we've had mid caps and small caps outperforming. Small caps have been underperforming pretty consistently in recent weeks and, uh, and months today. Uh, again, a mean reversion trade with financials, number one, out of all the sectors, energy, number two, and small caps leading the way higher. Nice bounce uh, higher for small caps. And small caps over the long term have performed much better on a relative basis. But if you look at the last couple months, that's completely changed as the small cap uh, performance has been overtaken by large and mega caps. Uh, the Nasdaq pushing higher as well, under underperforming uh, the S&P uh, by a little bit, and the VIX uh, just around 1620. Interest rates back higher. So after being in the 120 handle yesterday, we're back to around 136 uh, or so on the 10-year yield. The TLT, which is our proxy for bond prices, coming off pretty consistently today, down about 1.4%. And the dollar, which is in a pretty decent uptrend for a little while, fueling U.S. outperformance uh, of global markets, down about a quarter of a percent. I would argue that uptrend in the dollar is still very much in, uh, in play. We've talked about the strength in gold and sort of that bullish reversal, that uh, bullish engulfing, not the bullish engulfing pattern, the bullish divergence, momentum divergence, with lower lows in the GLD, higher lows in the RSI, and that following through today with the GLD pushing higher, really accelerated into the close yesterday and continuing that move uh, higher. Copper prices moving higher as well. There's been a relatively mixed or, or uh, non-correlation between stocks and copper, but today that's sort of uh, going back to uh, uh, everything in uh, positive mode. Cryptocurrencies getting a bit of a, a, a bid finally after a huge distribution in, in recent weeks. Uh, Bitcoin up only 1.8%, which is relatively low for a very volatile asset class, but overall in, uh, in decent shape. We're going to come back to sort of the long-term charts when we get to the Mindful Investor Live chart list. What I want to do now, though, is go to the uh, week, wrap the week chart. We're going to look at the last four trading days because it was a shortened holiday week. And we can look at our major asset classes and see how they've traded. If you follow along with my green mouse cursor, you can see where the S&P has been and what the other uh, asset classes have done as well. So starting the clock uh, at the end of last week, the S&P here, essentially flat for the week, uh, up 0.4%. Most of that came uh, today, really, uh, because yesterday I was sort of down on the week and, uh, and a nice strong finish to make a new closing high. So the S&P up 0.4%. In green, we have the dollar index using the UUP, which is essentially flat, down 0.1%. Here we have a cluster of, uh, of things. We have crude oil here down 1%, Bitcoin down 1%. In uh, purple, we have small cap stocks down 1.3%. The weakest performer uh, was the uh, emerging market index, EEM, which is down 2.3%. Everything else outperformed uh, the S&P. Again, the S&P up 0.4%. Uh, up 0.7% was the NASDAQ 100, the Qs. Uh, right here in pink and red, we have the uh, bond prices using the TLT up 1%. Finally, gold, the strongest performer out of the mix, uh, up 1.1%. So it was interesting, as of Thursday's close, bonds were the top performer. You talk about rates really accelerating to the downside and the implications of that. And again, what we've seen from the market with rates coming off with the market selling off midweek, it certainly has changed a bit from uh, you know, uh, weak, uh, weak uh, bond or bond yields going down being a tailwind for growth stocks, as opposed to uh, now it's sort of weaker interest rates indicating weaker economy, weaker economic conditions and peak growth. So rise in yields today, rise in the market, rise in growth, and especially the rise in uh, cyclical. So that's how the week played out. And again, overall, a relatively flat week. If you look at some of the previous uh, weeks with uh, with a lot of volatility, there, it was feast or famine during the uh, during the week and certainly ending in a position of strength there. Let's finish off our Wrap the Week segment going to the Mindful Investor Live chart list. As a reminder, we have this chart list uh, linked up to my blog on stockcharts.com. So if you go to the Articles tab, go to my homepage, which is called the Mindful Investor, and you can get this free chart list right at the top. There's a gray button with a link to the live chart list that'll get you to this point. You can save all the charts, send them to your friends, share them on social media, whatever uh, you would like to do. We'll start with the market trend model. This is a, uh, a market trend model using weekly data that I created years ago and have just followed as a general trend following mechanism running in the background. It tells me uh, basic things about 
risk on versus risk off, long-term and short-term trends, and uh, giving me a sense of the, the bias with which I should look at uh, all the other charts during the day. This is the first chart I look at every morning, by the way, just to make sure I orient myself to the long-term trend. And the long-term model, uh, using the longest uh, weekly exponential moving averages, turned bullish about a year ago, was, uh, just over that mid-June of last year, has remained very constructive. And that really just indicates the strong upward trend that we've seen in stocks. We're making, making new all-time highs again this week, so no real indication of change there. The medium-term model has actually been negative for the last uh, six weeks or so. About six weeks ago, it turned negative. We have this bearish crossover. This is using the traditional weekly PPO, very similar to the weekly MACD, if you're familiar with that. And that's my basic sort of uh, offense or defense model. When this is in a bullish configuration, it tells me to be thinking more on offense, think more about upside opportunity, make sure that you're capturing uh, opportunities of stocks that are breaking out and riding those trends as much as possible. When you get a sell signal from this model, which we did about six weeks ago, again, it doesn't tell me to ignore a chart that looks good. At any moment, I would follow a chart that's breaking out like an Amazon comes to mind with a big base uh, breaking out of a 10-month base. But when this model's turned negative, which it's been for the last six weeks, it tells me to be more on the defensive side, to think less about upside opportunity and more about downside potential. Make sure you have risk uh, measurements in place, stop losses in place, and you protect against potential downside. The short-term model, by the way, has been positive most of the last four months. There was one week uh, back here about a month ago where it turned negative very briefly and then turned right back positive as we resumed the, uh, the uptrend. So overall, it said that the short-term tactical trend has largely been positive. This next chart, we're looking at the daily chart of the S&P. We talk about this uh, pretty much every day we review this chart, but I remember particularly with Mark Newton talking about the strength in stocks and identifying some key levels uh, you know, Mark uh, shared the idea that uh, that the May lows, sort of the 40, 50, 40, 60 range, 40, 70, somewhere around here, would be the line in the sand for him. As long as we remain above that, that the uptrend is in good place. I don't, I don't mind that level, and I think that is absolutely the point of no return. We remain above there, and things can't be that bad. We break that, you really, if you've not already start to really uh, think defensively, I would argue you really should. But what are we seeing now? This week has certainly been a sign of strength. Taking yesterday's uh, drop out of the, the mix, overall, it's been a sign of accumulation over the course of the week. We're remaining above a trend line that we've been following here for the last uh, six, seven, eight months or so. Uh, we were remaining above the 50-day moving average. So on any pullback, the question number one is, do we hold the 50-day on a closing basis? If we break that, do we break through the 50-day moving average currently around 42.20? So if you think about it, getting down to those levels and maybe a little bit below that, the June lows, which are around 41.70, that'd be about a 5% drop from where we're at right now, sort of 45 to 5%, I would say. Uh, and it, that, what that means is if we would get a sell-off to that level, that would be very similar to the previous pullbacks that we've seen during this bull market phase so far in 2021 and, and even before that. That's been sort of the standard uh, pullback. We're about, uh, you know, almost two months uh, after the most recent pullback, actually right at two months since that early May sell-off. That's the last significant pullback that we've seen in stocks. So overall, we are overdue by any stretch of the imagine, I, I, imagination. I think the overbought conditions on the S&P, the overbought conditions on a lot of the growth areas that have been leadership certainly suggest going into next week for me, we're overextended and looking for some signs of uh, of further weakness. If we do, I think holding those lows around 41.70 is good for me. The final point of no return, uh, 40, 70, 40, 60, which is the lows from uh, May, would be pretty significant to pay attention to. What else can we re review given our time uh, together here in the Wrap the Week segment? The breadth picture is uh, is key. And if there's one chart I would ask you to take away, I think it's this one right here. Um, the S&P 500 has made new highs in the last week. The cumulative advanced decline line based on the S&P 500 has also made new highs. So that's a thumbs up. I've changed the color coding based on this transition that I think we are in the midst of. The mid-cap index, uh, mid-cap AD line did not make a new high, but it's not broken down yet. So it's sort of in neutral mode, sort of this neutral amber color. The NYSE common stock only AD line has made a lower high and has broken down through the 50-day and broken down through its low from mid-June. The same set of conditions has happened for the small cap AD line here at the bottom. Why is this such an important combination? This exact combination of the S&P AD line making new highs along with the market, the mid cap index not being able to do so, but being relatively flat and small caps and the NYSE uh, index, uh, the NYSE exchange, uh, both making lower highs. The last time we've seen that particular combination, February 2020, 2020 where the, the market made a new high January into February, the AD line on the S&P went higher. All these other ones did not confirm, and that non-confirmation was an early warning sign of the exhaustion 
of that bull market phase that ended in February 2020. And while this does not necessarily guarantee an exact duplicate of that performance, it certainly indicates upside exhaustion uh, potentially and tells me to be, pay special attention to, uh, to uh, breakdowns and lines in the sand. Uh, we've had a reduction in the number of new highs looking at the New York Stock Exchange relative to the previous cycles. Interesting to see this week, though, we've actually seen a nice expansion in new highs on the S&P 500. So one of the challenging periods I think you saw through the month of June was the market going higher, but less and less stocks making new highs. It's potentially alleviated here with a good number of stocks, about 15 percent earlier in this week, making a new 52 week high, which is not too bad. Um, what is concerning on a breadth basis is that only 44 percent of the S&P members uh, as of Thursday's close, we're above their 50-day uh, moving average. That is less uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a supportive fashion of the overall market going higher. At the April market high, 92% of the S&P members were making a new, uh, were, were above their 50-day moving average. Right about now, looking at that same measure, it's only 44%. So that's a much weaker configuration. You're also seeing weakness from the bullish percent index, which is looking at what percent of S&P members are in a bullish Point and figure chart pattern. When we get to the mailbag segment here in a little bit, we're going to ask or answer a particular question on point and figure chart. So uh, we'll take a quick commercial break. Back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. As a reminder, we're doing the charting, the second half special all next week on Stock Charts TV. Go to StockCharts.com slash charting the second half to ND per second, and you'll get all the uh, schedule of the upcoming events, all the great special uh, experts and uh, guidance that they'll have for you for the remainder of the year. Also, go to StockCharts.tv.com. Use your email, set up a free account. You can start accessing all of our great content from our fantastic hosts, uh, our guests like Mark Newton and others that we had on the show, and all of our special uh, events like the mid-year charting the second half. Go to StockChartsTV.com or go to any of the app stores on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. Our next segment is the Final Bar Mailbag. What we love to do is hear from you. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. Send us your questions at any point and we will gladly uh, point you in the right direction as much as possible. Today's question number one, I'm not sure how you approach managing portfolio exposure to stocks. Is it a weight of the evidence approach? After you've provided relevant information, I can generally tell if bullish or bearish conditions prevail, but how much? For instance, is it a standard mix, more bullish, extra bullish, uh, more bearish, extra bearish type of statements, uh, et cetera? So you know, the short answer, no. I, I mean, we try to, to, to stay away from making explicit recommendations. It's obviously not uh, within the scope of what we're, what we're doing, and it's really for educational and informational purposes only. Uh, with my own clients uh, for market misbehavior, my own firm, uh, we talk a lot about just overall leaning into and leaning, uh, leaning into or away from uh, different trends based on what they've done. In terms of actual portfolio exposure, I will tell you in my own process, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. In my own process, I don't think of it as much of uh, exposure to equities in particular. I think of all the different asset classes you could get exposure to. Maybe the wrap the week segment uh, where we look at that chart and look at the performance over the time. Maybe that's closest to what I would do. I run momentum models and they're similar to uh, things like Gary Antonacci's dual momentum investing, Med Favors, Ivy portfolio, Brian Livingston's uh, muscular portfolios. They all have very similar ideas where you're basically doing a basic trend following approach. You put a bunch of ETFs in a pile and you see which ones score the best based on some momentum measurement, some trend following mechanism. For me, that's sort of the passive portion of the portfolios that I would uh, I would run on my own are sort of driven by that sort of uh, a process. It's very as automated as possible because I find I'm best suited to uh, to help explain and, and illuminate the markets than trying to uh, speculate on the air for all of you. So that's how I would think of it. I would encourage you to look at things like the scooter rankings and others and experiment with ways those books that I mentioned might be a good starting point just to think about how you can Look at a group of asset classes and focus on what's working and lean into those, uh, lean away from what's not working. And, uh, and again, I have to limit the language I'm able to share on the air, as you can probably understand. 
Question number two, I read that standard stop orders need not be triggered by an actual trade at the stop price, but simply by a quote. Is this true? And the short answer is, uh, is absolutely yes. If so, it might make me rethink actual stops versus mental stops, or instead of stops using stock charts as alerts to warn me of price trigger, then manually, manually enter the trade. And you actually kindly laid it out a particular, uh, a particular scenario. So uh, the, the answer is absolutely. So that's how it works. When you think about uh, a stop order, uh, you know, basically it's using uh, the bid ask spread, right? So it's looking for the bid price to hit a certain uh, 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 threshold, which is the level that you set as your limit. Once that sets, then your order is uh, is put into the market. There's this thing called slippage, which your question is basically describing, which is let's say the your 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 stop is set at ten dollars and the price comes down to ten dollars, the bid hits ten dollars a share, your 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 uh, your your order is placed. Um, the challenge there is where your order is actually executed, right? And so um, there's this there's this uh, gap between where a an alert is triggered or where an order is triggered and the process of it actually going in. And even in the split second, if it happens very fast, there could be a little movement in the market. And so you're, you know, the, the stop gets hit at 10 and you might get filled at a little different level because of that. There are a lot of different ways to create those orders. I'd encourage you to look at your particular brokerage platform and see what options you have because there are a lot of different ways they might provide uh, to allow you to, to have some flexibility with that. But the basic stop uh, order that you described, that is basically how it uses, and it does not use the actual trades, it uses the bid ask spread, and you should be looking at the bid price to see whether it's gonna be uh, gonna be executed. On less liquid names, by the way, remember the bid ask spread can actually be relatively wide, so something to, something to think about if you're trading like smaller micro cap stocks. Um, next question, I've been watching for a few months and haven't heard you discuss buying triggers. Any general thoughts? I'm trying to develop a process and lined out this laid out this beautiful process, price greater than $10 a share, volume over 200,000 uh, shares, I'm guessing a day, price crossing over the 50 day moving average, RSI over 50, and I'm cherry picking a, a number of things here, review charts for higher highs and higher lows. I don't mind the, the description that you laid out. And I think for me, what you're describing is uh, two different things. You know, Some people try to automate uh, a, a process like that and, and try to turn that into a trading system. Here are all the criteria. I'm going to screen for stocks that fit this exact thing, and I'm going to trade when all of them are triggered. Boom, I'm done. And then just keep, keep the model going. I tend to think of it in a much more subjective, much more discretionary process. So I would use the criteria that you laid out to screen for ideas. I would look for, for stocks that fit some of those criteria, and then and maybe some of the criteria you laid out, and then they use the rest of the criteria to confirm the trade and actually execute on it. What you're describing to me, though, is more of a checklist. And, and again, if you if you followed a lot of my work, you know, a lot of it comes from aviation. And so it's all about, you know, what you do as a pilot. If you think about when you're flying an airplane, it's all about checklists. You have a checklist for everything. You want to start the propeller. You want to, uh, you know, try a stall. You want to, uh, you know, hold short and then take off. You have checklists for every little thing. And emergencies, you have the same, uh, a different checklist that you're supposed to follow. So for me, I think you're actually describing a very good checklist. And I have my own checklist, which I've described in in different places where it starts with price, it starts with the Dow theory. Is this is the market in the higher highs and higher lows or lower lows and lower highs? Is it in an uptrend or downtrend? And it goes from there. Um, and, and so I think having a good checklist that you follow and as you're getting started, really following it to a T and literally writing out the answers to each question, that's how you're going to internalize your technical process. That's how you're going to be able to refine it. And your real question at the beginning should be what should be on my checklist and what should not. Uh, and, and so I think you've described a fairly, uh, fairly decent uh, starting point for a, for a technical checklist to confirm buy or sell decisions. Final question we probably have time for today. Thanks for your great videos every day. You're absolutely welcome. My question is, I discovered a secret part of the site. I love this. I accidentally viewed my candle glance chart as point and figure charts and was surprised to see bullish or bearish price objectives based on the basic point and figure patterns and movements. Um, I love that. So we're looking at the Dow uh, stocks, which is one of the chart lists I usually just have up. And what you are suggesting is here where it says chart duration, you can switch timeframes. I actually have a custom style that I usually show on the air, but you can also say point and figure chart. And what you're saying is there's this line here, which says bullish price objective for, and, and it's telling that most of these have bullish price objectives. Some of them have bearish price objectives. You can see the levels uh, laid out on the sheet. Your, your question is, is this a secret uh, part of this? Is this a secret stock charts trading system that no one knows about and you discovered it? So the bad news is no, uh, but I was actually surprised to see that all of those objectives are on there. I'll tell you what they are and I'll tell you why they're important. You'll see some of these have like a bright green uh, indication, like on Apple, CRM, and these, this is the members of the Dow. Uh, Cisco, you see Dow, uh, Dow Holdings showing a red uh, signal. So that is the current column is currently showing an active point and figure signal. 
And what that means is if you're in a column of X's, you break above the previous column, you're still in that active column, you're gonna have a bright green message that says point figure pattern, it's gonna tell you what it is. If the chart has broken down like a Dow ticker DOW has done, that says you're in a column of O's that's broken below the previous column, that's an active signal, and it's telling you the downside objective based on the traditional measurement of that signal. These other ones are basically old signals where it's not, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong one, Chevron, for example, right? Currently, you're in a column of O's that has not gone below the previous column of O's. So you're not in an active uh, signal. The last signal was actually this column, uh, where was it? This column of X's here that broke above the previous column of X's. So it's basically taking that same measurement. That's the bullish price objective. But once you go to the next column, which means there's a bit of a reversal, that's no longer an active price objective necessarily. It still can be important to look at. It still can be an interesting uh, thing to see if the market goes higher and if you eventually uh, access those, uh, those upside or downside objectives, but it's not really an active signal anymore. So what's interesting, and, and I did not realize this until you asked your question, on the regular point figure charts, we actually don't show this uh, you know, expired bullish price objective or bearish price objective. We do show it on the candle glance page. That's a really great catch. Uh, I'm going to talk with our developers and see how we want to think about that. But uh, so the answer is yes, those are price objectives from a previous column. It's no longer really active because we're not in that column anymore. I still think it could be helpful and might be worth dropping your uh, portfolio, your holdings into the, uh, into the candle glance function, looking at the point figure chart and see where we're at relative to some of those long-term objectives. For today, uh, we need to wrap the show. Thanks for all those great questions. We're going to wrap the show with the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one, we spent some time talking about this configuration with breadth. I would argue going into next week, this is maybe the most important chart. It is really hard, I will tell you, to be cautious and negative as the market is making new all-time highs, but I'm finding myself doing that here today. I'm seeing rates overall still in a downtrend. I'm seeing that uh, becoming a headwind to uh, upside for the market. I saw the distribution Thursday as part of something a little bigger. I don't think we've pulled back enough after these overbought conditions. And the breadth picture looks eerily similar to the breadth picture in February of 2020, particularly the S&P advanced decline going higher, but none of the other uh, advanced decline lines confirming that most recent high. Now, this could be alleviated if the market rallies enough to make all of these AD lines go and make new highs along with the market making new highs. So it absolutely could be negated. But at this point, I'm left looking uh, at this chart and looking at the chart from February 2020. They look really, really similar. For me, that tells me uh, you know, potential downside ahead. Chart number two is the chart of Citigroup. You know, I'm not surprised to see interest rates bounce today after the dis distribution that you've seen or really after the accumulation in, uh, in, uh, with bond prices. Uh, and you saw a bullish uh, momentum divergence in things like gold recently that have played out so well. I'm actually seeing that pattern in a lot of the financial stocks right now, not all of them. Uh, so not all of them are looking this, uh, this uh, clean, uh, but Citigroup is certainly giving you an example of lower lows in price, higher lows, in the, uh, in the RSI overall, that suggests downside exhaustion, a potential bounce. The way you would confirm that bottoming pattern is a break above the swing high, which is here around $72 uh, from, uh, from late June. That would be the level that would confirm that uh, bullish uh, momentum divergence, something to certainly watch going into next week. The last chart of the three and three for me is the chart of semiconductors. We're using the SMH, and I think it's worth noting as the market is going to new high, semiconductors have not really been. They made a bit of a breakout there in late June, but really came back and, uh, and have retested, uh, come down back toward the 50-day uh, before a bounce today. I think next week could be really critical to see if semiconductors break out of this resistance level, finally getting above 260, which is where it's found resistance a number of times uh, in the last six months. You can also see the relative strength, which I think is key. It broke out on a relative basis in the end of June when price made new highs, but now that's failed so far in coming back down. And charts like this, failing to make new all-time highs uh, would be a significant check in the not so bullish column, indicating that there's some weakness and that stocks are unable to really propel themselves further on beyond resistance. Folks, that is our show for today. And that's a wrap for this week on The Final Bar. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. We're in the process of transitioning the show back to 4 p.m. Eastern. We hope to get that to you very, very soon. But for now, we'll keep it at 6 p.m. Eastern every evening. You can watch all of our previous episodes on our YouTube channel, also on StockChartsTV.com, our StockCharts TV on-demand platform. Finally, shoot us any questions that come up as you're reviewing your charts over the weekend. The final bar at StockCharts.com is our email. We'd love to hear from you. From everyone at StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller here in Redmond, Washington. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you next week. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.